This grilled cheese is made with Oaxacan cheese or queso Oaxaca. One of the, if not the stretchiest cheeses in the world. I'm sure you're aware, not all cheeses will create a cheese pole like this. Which begs the question, why do some cheeses melt and others don't? And furthermore, of those cheeses that melt, why do some become stretchy and others become gooey? And that's what I hope to clear up today. So let's just jump right into it. You've got hundreds, maybe thousands of different kinds of cheeses in the world. To simply Let's categorize those into two sections. Cheeses that melt and cheeses that don't. An example of a cheese that doesn't melt is something like a feta cheese, ricotta, something that kind of crumbles and is soft. And then you've got a cheese like a mozzarella that is just soft and ooey and melty. And when heat is introduced, it will easily melt and become stringy and gooey. The reason for that is that there are two ways to curdle milk to create cheese. The first way is by introducing acid to it, which is how feta or ricotta is made. We made ricotta recently. Ricotta means recook, and it's usually a byproduct made from the whey that's left over in the mozzarella making process. You add an acid to that, and it coagulates the cheese. Some people condense it, and it creates something similar to like a feta. Ricotta can be dried and compressed for like a ricotta salata, and these cheeses don't melt. What happens is the acid coagulates the milk, forcing milk proteins to bond together. And usually there's this kind of calcium glue that holds it all together and creates like the structure of a cheese. But the acid dissolves that calcium glue and makes it non-existent. And that forces the proteins together tightly, which force out moisture, which is what is needed to make a cheese melt. It's a proper proportion of fat and moisture and a protein structure that is just right to enable all of this melting to happen. Rennet, on the other hand, has a much lower acidity than using lemon juice or a vinegar. So what rennet allows for is these chains of proteins to similarly bond together like it does in the non-melting cheeses, but in such a way that they're not so tightly packed and that this calcium glue sort of helps hold all the fat and the moisture together in between these proteins so that when heat is introduced, the cheese can melt. Sort of like how train cars are held together, there's space in between them, but they still kind of lock together so that they never fully pull apart or they never crash together. That's similarly what's happening with the rennet. I'm not good with all the science stuff, but Harold McKee is, and he explains it in such a way that is probably a bit more clear for some science heads out there. He says rennet creates a malleable structure of large casein molecules, which are just the milk proteins held together by relatively few calcium atoms and hydrophobic bond. So this structure is readily weakened by heat. Acid, on the other hand, dissolves the calcium glue that holds the casein proteins together in my cells and eliminates each protein's negative electrical charge, which would otherwise cause the proteins to repel. The proteins are free to flock together and bond ex extensively into microscopic clumps. So basically a cheese that melts well is one that has the right proportion of fat and has the right cellular structure of proteins to hold that all together. Now, this video is about melting, so we don't need to talk about non-melting cheeses anymore. Now, of these melting cheeses I have here, we can classify those into kind of two categories. One is you get an ooey gooey sort of category, which is what you have here with the brie, as you can see in this room that's room temperature. Besides this rind that's completely edible, the thing's already melted. Then you have a mozzarella, which is sort of stringier, and you can sort of peel it. And although it's in the same temperature as the brie, it may sweat a little bit and loosen up, but it's not gonna melt. Gooey cheeses are things like cheddar, gouda, American cheese, brie is a gooey cheese. Stringier cheeses are things like cheese curds, fresh mozzarella, and what I have here, Oaxacan cheese, which I consider to be the stretchiest cheese on earth, which are some of the best stretchiest melting cheeses out there. The mozzarella cheese and the Oaxacan cheese are very similar. They're both made in the cheese making style of pasta filata, which is a cheese making process famous in Italy for stretching the cheese curds to form something like a mozzarella or in Mexico, a Oaxacan cheese. It's sort of believed that Dominican monks brought this process from Italy to Mexico, which yielded the birth of Oaxacan cheese. The Oaxacan cheese is 
stretched into really long threads and then rolled up into this kind of like yarn of cheese. And I believe it's the way that it's stretched and rolled that gives it the ability to be one of the stretchiest cheeses you could possibly use. Now something like a mozzarella or the Oaxaca, it won't make a good cheese sauce, but it will make something like a good cheese sandwich, a grilled cheese, mozzarella sticks, something like that. Something like an American cheese or a cheddar. Those things make a great cheese sauce. They can also make a great grilled cheese sandwich, but there's two things you gotta consider now about when you're using a creamier cheese. Say you're gonna use a cheddar. This is an aged cheddar, this is a younger cheddar. This cheddar is going to melt differently than this cheddar. The reason some of these things melt differently is because of the aging process. The mozzarella, the Oaxacan cheese, those are unaged cheeses. So when you're making them, the milk proteins are stretched really long. And as a result, as it melts, that stringiness maintains. But as it ages, enzymes sort of eat away at those long strands of proteins into much smaller ones. And that creates a much gooier end result. And then as it ages, you start to lose moisture content. And then that perfect ratio of meltability of fat, moisture, and cell structure gets out of whack and you don't have the proper amount of moisture to sort of get it through a proper melt. That's why a younger cheese is something more preferable in a grilled cheese rather than really long aged, intense flavored cheeses like this. For me, the way to work around it is use a blend of a younger cheese and an older cheese so you can get that flavor combination. And then the reason why a processed cheese like American cheese melts the way that it does is because they add acid and phosphates to it. It allows that acid to not dissolve away that calcium, keeping those milk proteins separated but avoiding hard clumping together like you get in a cheese made with acid. That kind of cheese is even more gooey, but it has a great mouthfeel, which is why we I used it in my Thanksgiving mac and cheese. And it's why the three cheese grilled cheese that I covered on the show and was one of the premier sellers on my old food truck, we just used three different cheeses to sort of replicate the same mouthfeel as American cheese, but using better quality cheeses and some that are aged and some that weren't to add flavor. So armed with all this information, we know about cheeses now. We can use this information to make smarter decisions and to pick out cheeses properly for whatever it is we need. Today I really want to make a grilled cheese that has a crazy grilled cheese pull. So rather than using mozzarella, which sometimes has a little bit too much moisture in it, I'm going to use the Oaxacan cheese. If you want to make the world's longest fried mozzarella, fried queso Oaxaca, this is how you do it. But as you can see, it's just one long string of cheese that they stretch out, which I believe lends itself to its stringiness. And just like string cheese, you just wanna kinda tear it. You can see it's got some elasticity to it. This is the cheese in Mexico they use mainly for quesadillas. They use it in the birria tacos that are super popular right now. Pretty mild cheese. I think it has a really nice mild flavor for a melting cheese. I like to use a nice sourdough bread to go in this sandwich and then in the style that we made it on the truck, we had the sandwich dry to the pan and we toast it on both sides. Then we smear the thinnest layer of mayo to each side of the toasted bread. Use that to brown each side and then once each side is browned, we're just gonna flip the sandwich until the cheese is properly melted. So you wanna see a little trick? I learned from my friend Mackenzie at Grilled Cheese Social. She knows a thing or two about cheese pulls, and I'm gonna show you a trick. So what we wanna do to maintain the stretchiness of the cheese inside is I'm going to slice the bread on top and then flip it over and slice the bread on the bottom without cutting through the cheese. So then we can pull it apart and get the stretchiest cheese you've ever seen. Like this, serrated knife helps. It's just more fun to eat when it stretches. How big your cheese pulled is completely dependent on how much cheese you put inside. You put in a boatload of cheese, you're gonna get a huge cheese pull. Hopefully this video makes you just a little bit more wise about cheese. Now, I'm not great with all the science-y stuff. I kinda just wanna get the gist of it and I hope I explained it clear enough to you guys. If you guys wanna learn more about science-y kind of stuff and try and maybe understand it a little bit better, Kenji Alt Lopez is the guy for you. I'm sure you're all well aware. Anyway, that's all that I have today. I'll see you next time. Until then, take care of yourself and go feed yourself.
you're looking for some cheesy recipes that you want to make, I got four of them on the screen right now. I suggest you make this mac and cheese with a Thanksgiving stuffing crust. 